welcome to the morning worship service of the First Baptist Church of Carrollton, Georgia. We are John Greer, Susan Greer, Avery Greer, and Inslee Greer, and we are so glad you have decided to join us. Today's service will include a ch children's sermon from Jennifer Gendrick, an anthem by our sanctuary choir, and a sermon from our pastor, Steve Davis. Rosa and Connor Kennard are serving as lay readers, and Inslee will be leading the Lord's Prayer. The stewardship prayer will be led by Dello O'Neill. Let us pray together at this time. Loving God, we are thankful for the opportunity to worship you this morning. We are grateful for your word and what it teaches us regarding how to live. Through our worship today, may we not only grow closer to you, but also experience change in how we think and relate to each other. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've been planning Virtual Vacation Bible School. Virtual VBS is going to be June 8th through the 12th. During that week, I'll send VBS videos for you to watch. You'll get a VBS kit with lots of fun activities to do. And we'll have daily Zoom Bible study lessons. Even though VBS is going to look a little bit different this year, we're still going to have lots of fun learning about Jesus together. So make sure that your parents register you for virtual VBS on Realm. For our children's sermon today, I brought something to show you. Look at all these delicious Georgia blueberries. This week, I went to Anna Claire's house and I bought 12 packages, 12 pints of blueberries. We really like blueberries at our house. And blueberries are good for you, right? But would it be good for me to eat all 12 packages of blueberries in one day? No way! If I did that, I'd get sick. So even though I like blueberries, and blueberries are good for me, I need to have some self-control and not eat them all in one day. One of the scripture passages that Pastor Steve is going to preach about today is the fruit of the Spirit. We learned about the fruit of the Spirit in Cam 3, so you know that self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. One of the ways that we can have self-control is by living a life in moderation. Living life in moderation means that we balance out all the things that we want to do with all the things that we need to do. 
For example, you might want to play your Xbox all day and all night, but you probably need to get a good night's sleep and to play outside with your friends and to spend some time with your family and maybe read your Bible and spend some time with God. Living a life in moderation is hard. Having self-control is hard. So aren't we glad that the Holy Spirit helps us with that? Aren't we glad that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control? Why don't we say the fruit of the Spirit Bible verse together? Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, pour out your goodness and grace on all who grieve, on all who fear, and on all who live with pain. Lead our nation and all the world, especially during this time of crisis, into your paths of peace. Let our cups overflow with mercy. Hear us as we pray for those we love and for those that we fear. We pray for those who live in fear of violence and for those who make them feel afraid. We pray for those who live in mansions and for those who live on the street. We pray for those who have too much and for those who have too little. We pray for those who live in sickness and those who find ways to bring them relief. We pray for those who've asked us to pray and for those who cannot pray for themselves. We pray for all who need our prayer. We pray for our own needs and weakness. And for what else shall we pray this day? We pray for healing and hope and moderation. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God of all time and space, of your holy days and ordinary moments, we come to you in this time of worship. We give you thanks for your gift of time, for our gift of years, however many they may bring. We confess, O Lord, that we have not always been good stewards of your gift. We have given our resources to that which does not satisfy us, does not refresh us, does not make a difference in our lives or in the lives of our brothers and sisters. We have filled our lives too full and have declined your invitation to come and rest. We have been content to fill our lives doing many things instead of seeking that which we are called to do. Forgive us, O Lord, when we divide our lives into your time and our time, for you are Lord over all the hours of all of our days. Forgive us, O Lord. We pray for those whose days are filled with too many responsibilities, too many tasks. And we pray as well for those whose days are empty and seem to stretch out forever. For all of them and for all of us, we pray for your peace, for your rest that brings not only refreshments, but teaches us self-control. Teach us, O Lord, to be reverent and respectful to you and all you have created. Teach us, O Lord, to recognize in our common days your uncommon grace. Good morning. Today, our scripture room will come out of Ecclesiastes 7, 15 through 18, and Galatians 5, 16 through 23. And first, I'll read Ecclesiastes. I have seen everything in my pointless lifetime. The righteous person may die in spite of their righteousness. Then again, the wicked may live long in spite of their wickedness. Don't be too righteous or too wise, or you may be dumbfounded. Don't be too wicked and don't be a fool, or you may die before your time. 
It's good that you take hold of one of these without letting go of the other, because the one who fears God will go forth with both. Now we'll be reading out of Galatians five sixteen through 23. I say be guided by the Spirit and you won't carry out your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other so you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. But if you are being led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious since they include sexual immorality, moral corruption, and whatever feels good, adultery, drug use and casting spells, hate, fighting, obsession, losing your temper, competitive opposition, conflict, selfishness, group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. I warn you as I have already warned you that those who do these kind of things won't inherit God's kingdom, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentle, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. For the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
a little boy and his family would go eat Sunday lunch, and uh, they decided one Sunday to go eat at a Mexican restaurant. The little kid had never had Mexican food before, so he's pretty excited. They brought out the appetizer, as you know, it's chips and salsa. It's unbelievable how good it is, right? And he dove into that and started eating that, and he was fascinated by this concept of free food before the meal comes. So he dug in, and he loved this free appetizer, and he was just eating lots of chips and salsa. His parents said, now, son, slow down because you ordered a meal. You know, enchiladas are coming, so don't eat too much. But he was just enamored with this idea of, of food before food. And she, he should have known he was in trouble when the enchiladas arrived because he was already full. But he had to eat them because he was afraid his parents would say, oh, we're not bringing you back here again if you don't eat your meal. So he ate his meal too, and then he started feeling sick. And he realized, boy, I'm getting sick. And he, he jumped up and headed for the bathroom, but didn't make it. He lost his lunch, and several people saw him. It was embarrassing. His dad got up and helped him to the restroom, all the while lecturing him on the virtue of moderation. Uh, he had a hard time comprehending this idea of how more of a good thing is not always better. Last week we talked about wisdom, this Sunday moderation, next week courage, thinking about some virtues that are important for all of us. So the writer of Ecclesiastes, who's known as the preacher or the teacher, uh, we think of the writer as Solomon, uh, apparently had too much Mexican food one Sunday and didn't quite make it to the restroom and came home and wrote chapter 7. And I like this brief passage where he says, and he kind of brags about it. He says, in my vain life, I've, had, I've seen everything. There are some righteous people who perish in their righteousness. There are wicked people who prolong their life with their evil doing. Then verse 18, I like this. He says, it is good that you should take hold of the one without letting go of the other. So he says, don't be too righteous and don't be wicked. Grab hold of both of those rails of life and find some moderation. Well, Solomon had done everything. He had been there and twice, been there back and twice. I mean, he had done it all. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Think about it. When I was a kid and the preacher told us that, I thought he said 300 porcupines. Same deal, though, right? So this guy, I mean, I wonder how Mother's Day went with him. This guy had, had seen everything, and he was filthy rich. He said, I've learned a lot in my life, and what I've learned is don't be self-righteous. Don't be too righteous. Do you know people who are, who are that way? They're holier than thou. I do. I, I got people, friends I know who, who cannot talk without re using religious cliches, and I don't even want to be around them. But I also know some pretty wicked people. Uh, so don't be wicked, he says. Now, you can have a little mischief. There are legendary stories around our church about, say, when Phil Carter was growing up, mischief. Marty and Chris Smith, all the stuff they did. But it wasn't wicked stuff. It was just having fun, a little bit of a mischief. So the writer says, take hold of both sides of life and try to walk in the middle. Don't be self-righteous, but don't be wicked, he says. I, I would add, just be real. Be transparent, be real, and get real. So I think the writer is saying that moderation helps us tread the line but between two unhealthy choices. Our culture is split on extremes. Have you noticed? Sometimes the best choice is a moderate one. We don't hear too many moderate voices in our, in our culture. So I want to say a good word about moderation. You might want to call it something else. You might want to call it restraint or self-control. And it always inquire, requires some discipline. But it's a really good thing. So I'm wondering if the coronavirus has taught us anything about moderation. Have you thought, you know, there's some things I could do without and have a good life? Have you had any moderation with food or clothes or entertainment? Uh, I love sports as much as anybody. I really do. And I hope we get it back soon. But I've kind of learned, you know, I can have a pretty good life without sports. We're hoping that football season happens, and our culture is way 
too enamored with football, and I'm sometimes I'm that way too, and we're just fanatical about it. So an Alabama fan, a Georgia fan, and a Georgia Tech fan were standing on the edge of a cliff arguing about who was the most fanatical fan. The Alabama, Alabama fan jumped off the cliff yelling, I'm the most radical fan. The Georgia fan said, no, I'm the most radical. And he pushed the Georgia Tech fan off the cliff. Not much moderation today. In today's world, we take everything to an extreme. I suppose you can exercise to an extreme or diet to an extreme. Uh, the preacher was preaching a sermon on moderation. And he preached a really hard sermon on moderation. As a lady was leaving church that day, she said, Preacher, I think you overdid it. You overdid the sermon on moderation. Now, if you want to argue with me, you can. And the argument would be that moderation, on the one hand, is not really Christian at all. Because Jesus preached really radical stuff. He didn't preach moderation. When he told his followers to take up a cross, which meant that you may die, is that moderation? I don't think so. When he told the rich young ruler, he was filthy rich, this guy had everything. And this guy said, I want to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus said what to him? He said, sell everything you've got, everything, give it to the poor, and then follow me. Was that moderation? I don't think so. When he said, love your enemy, that's pretty radical stuff. It wasn't moderation at all. So you could argue, if you want to, that moderation is for people who don't take Christianity seriously enough. On the other hand, you can also argue that it is very Christian, taking the words of Paul. And Paul was a radical guy. I mean, that, this was an obsessive kind of guy who didn't do anything halfway. High energy kind of guy, probably kind of guy drive you crazy but he was the most serious Christian maybe ever but in today's other passage he talks about the fruit of the spirit and he talks about self-control the fruit of the spirit is self-control or discipline or moderation so I think that moderation discipline restraint is the key to a happy productive life so do you want to have a happy, productive life? Then try a little discipline in your life. Uh, every day, have some discipline. Have some discipline in what you eat and really how much you eat. Have some discipline about exercise for your body. Uh, read a good book. Read something every day to stimulate your mind. And read some scripture or meditate on some scripture and pray every day. These are the kind of things that will give you the wonderful discipline you need for your Christian life. As a minister, I have to discipline myself every week because every week I've got to write an article and preach a sermon. And I've had people say to me, how do you do that every week? And my response is, how do you practice law or medicine? Or how do you teach every week? Same thing, discipline, moderation, self-control. Now, ironically, what I believe is that moderation, restraint, actually brings pleasure. It's not a denial of pleasure. Uh, people say to us, well, you Christians, you don't know how to have a good time. I say to them, you should come to a church fellowship. We have a blast. People think we've been drinking too much. We have so much fun. Billy Joel uh, had a song years ago, that only the good die young. One of the lines, uh, verses in the song is they say there's a heaven for those who will wait some say it's better but I say it ain't I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints the sinners have much more fun well Billy I think you're wrong about that uh, do you know my friend moderate Mike moderate Mike goes to his mailbox every day looking for an invitation to the party. But he doesn't get invited to the party because people think, well, he's not any fun. Who gets invited to the party? It's P 
Patty the party girl, that's who. The wild and crazy, off the wall, hilarious person. Let's invite her to the party, cause she's so much fun. I wanna say, really? A moderation is a key to pleasure because moderation puts off a lot of pleasure for later. Moderation enjoys pleasure in small doses. We Christians have a lot of fun. We just do it with smaller doses. Moderation gives you something to look forward to. Forgive the grammar. There's no greater pleasure than to have something on the horizon. I do worry sometimes about 16-year-olds. I know a lot of them. And they're great people, great families. But they've had so much. They have cars nicer than any car I've ever had in my life. They've been to every Caribbean island. Uh, they've traveled the world. They've been to Europe. They've been to Disney 48 times. And, you know, it, I, I wonder what is there to look forward to. When is enough enough? So I think one of the keys is to uh, put off the pleasure and have something to look forward to. So during this virus, I've watched some series on TV that I would not have otherwise watched. I've watched the series Ozark. Have you watched that? I cannot wait. I've watched all three seasons. I cannot wait for season four. See, the key to a good book is that you cannot wait for the next chapter. It's a page turner, and, and it, there's so much anticipation. There's pleasure out there on the horizon, but not yet. You have to uh, it, have something to look forward to. It's the key to a, a good book. It's the key to a, a good sermon. You know, anticipation is one of life's greatest pleasures. It's a wonderful thing, a marvelous thing. So the disciplined writer or the disciplined, disciplined preacher doesn't give you the whole thing at the beginning. So I've heard a million sermons. Well, maybe that's an exaggeration. I've heard a few. I hate it when the preacher stands up and says at the beginning of his sermon, today point one is going to be this and point two and point three, and he gives you all the points at the beginning. When that happens, there's a little switch in my brain that goes click, and I think, I'm, I'm going to think about something else during this sermon because He's already told me what he's going to tell me. So moderation gives you something to look forward to. It gives you pleasure out there, not just all of it right now. And so walk a fine balance in your life between the extremes. Sometimes more is not better. Moderation is about self-control. So there are two extremes that you should always try to avoid. One is asceticism. And the other is materialism. Now, you know what materialism is. It's the worship of the golden calf of possessions and money. Do you know anybody who worships possessions and money? A better question might be, do you know anybody who doesn't worship that? Asceticism, on the other hand, obsesses on possessions, but it demonizes them. It says they're a bad thing and you should do without any of that. So, walk a fine line. Uh, I'm not materialistic, not too much. And those of you who knew and loved Sherry knew that she wasn't at all. She, she cared so much more about people than she did money or things or possessions. She just loved people. When we were first married, we didn't have much. I was a campus minister. It's pretty low in the food chain uh, in terms of salary. If you look for ministers, it's about the lowest, so I didn't make much. And at that time, she was a receptionist. Now, we, we didn't lack for basic necessities, but it was kind of a struggle. So when we got married, we had two refrigerators because I had one, she had one, and she had a nice one. It, was a really, and it had an ice maker, which was a pretty big deal back in those days. So we had a good one and a not-so-good one. And I came home from work one day. And I noticed that the nice refrigerator was gone. I said, what happened to the nice refrigerator? And she said, I, I gave it away. I said, what? You gave it away? Why didn't you give away the good one? And she said, well, I met this young couple. And they were really struggling. And they, didn't have, they don't have much. And they needed a refrigerator. So you gave them ours. You didn't sell it. You gave it to them. Yeah, I, I gave it to them. I said, what do they do? She said, he's a lawyer and she's a court reporter. I said, what? Well, the truth is, a lot of young lawyers especially 
have huge law school debt, and that's what they had. They had a huge debt, and they were stressed. And, and so Sherry gave them our nice refrigerator with the ice maker. So for the first 10 or 15 years of our marriage, we had the bad refrigerator with no ice maker. And when we had guests over, I'd try to make a big scene. I'd, I'd get out the ice trays to make sure they saw that I was getting the ice from ice trays, and I would tell that story and kind of needle Sherry about giving away the good refrigerator, but that's who she was. She didn't care about possession. She cared about people. Well, we were, and I'm not ascetic either, so I don't want you to think that I am. I like my creature comforts. I have a really nice uh, flat screen TV. I eat well. I don't lack for things. I go on vacations. I go to football games. I play some golf. I don't feel guilty about that at all, but moderation is the key. So like everybody else, folks, we got to make sure our hearts are in the right place, make sure our hearts are in God's hands. In this culture, there are a lot of tugs on the heart, as you know. Make sure your heart is in God's hands. Make sure your priorities are right. What I say is don't eat all the chips before the meal. Save some room for the enchiladas. Please pray with me. Dear God, as we're gathered here this morning together in spirit, though separated through space in our individual homes, we thank you that we are still able to connect in this way as your church to celebrate your grace and love to us. At this time of uncertainty, we pray for discernment and peace for those directly affected by this virus, whether as researchers, healthcare workers, patients, or those designated as essential workers. We pray for safety, peace, and healing of body and of spirit. For our local, state, and national leaders, we pray you will provide wisdom and humility as they seek to guide us through this time. We are so thankful for our church staff and ask your blessing on each one of them as they continue to pray, to plan, and to serve without the benefit of being together to encourage one another. We thank you, God, for the technology that makes it possible for us to remain connected even when apart. As we consider your many gifts to us, may we joyfully return to you our time, talents, and financial gifts for the advancement of your kingdom in our church family, our community, and to all the nations of our world. Lord, bless these, our offerings, for it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. I know these are difficult times and frustrating and it's been hard on all of us. And so I would encourage you to keep your heads up, keep your faith and continue to have the, the self-control, the discipline, the moderation that you're gonna need to make it through this. Uh, in consultation with our deacons and others, our staff, we're still looking for a June 14th return to worship with some uh, guidelines that you have seen. We'll make sure you know those guidelines. And of course, all this is subject to change depending on the guidelines from our state and local authorities. But in the meantime, uh, let's continue to, to honor Christ. And I would challenge you to help us to continue to be the church and, and reach out this week to someone that you know or that you don't know very well in our church who might need uh, 
uh, your prayers and your support. Because this is tough on everybody. So continue to live out your faith the very best that you can. Uh, continue to connect with people and love people uh, and, and, and show the, the love of God to, to your friends, to your neighbors, and to those in our church. We're people called First Baptist Church, caring people, sharing God's love.